This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tragedy of King Richard the Second by William Shakespeare. Act Five, Scene One, London, a street leading to the tower. Enter the Queen and ladies. This way the king will come. This is the way to Julius Caesar's ill-erected tower, to whose flint bosom my condemned lord is doomed a prisoner by proud Bolingbroke. Here let us rest, if this rebellious earth have any resting for her true king's queen. Enter King Richard and guard. But soft but see, or rather do not see, my fair rose wither. Yet look up, behold, that you in pity may dissolve to dew and wash him fresh again with true love tears ah thou the model where old troy did stand thou map of honour thou king richard's tomb and not king richard thou most beauteous inn why should hard-favoured grief be lodged in thee when triumph is become an alehouse guest join not with grief fair woman do not so to make my end too sudden learn good soul to think our former state a happy dream from which awaked the truth of what we are shows us but this i am sworn brother sweet to grim necessity and he and i will keep a league till death hie thee to france and cloister thee in some religious house our holy lives must win a new world's crown which our profane hours here have thrown down What? Is my Richard both in shape and mind transformed and weakened? Hath Bolingbroke disposed thine intellect? Hath he been in thy heart? The lion dying thrusteth forth his paw, and wounds the earth if nothing else, with rage to be o'erpowered. And wilt thou, pupil-like, take the correction mildly, kiss the rod and fawn on rage with base humility, which art a lion and the king of beasts? A king of beasts, indeed, if aught but beasts, I had been still a happy king of men. Good sometimes, queen, prepare thee hence for France. Think I am dead, and that even here thou takest, as from my deathbed, thy last living leave. In winter's tedious nights sit by the fire with good old folks, and let them tell thee tale of woeful ages long ago betide and ere thou bid good night to quit their griefs tell thou the lamentable tale of me and send the hearers weeping to their bed for why the senseless brands will sympathize the heavy accent of thy moving tongue and in compassion weep the fire out and some will mourn in ashes some coal black for the deposing of a rightful king. Enter Northumberland, attended. My lord, the mind of Bolingbroke is changed. You must to Pomfret, not unto the tower. And, madam, there is an order ta'en for you. With all swift speed, you must away to France. Northumberland, thou ladder, wherewithal the mounting Bolingbroke ascends my throne. The time shall not be many hours of age more than it is ere foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption. Thou shalt think, though he divide the realm and give thee half, it is too little, helping him to all, and he shall think that thou, which knowest the way to plant unrightful kings, will know again, being ne'er so little urged, another way to pluck him headlong from the usurped throne. The love of wicked men converts to fear that fear to hate and hate turns one or both to worthy danger and a deserved death my guilt be on my head and there at an end take leave and part for you must part forthwith doubly divorced bad men ye violate a twofold marriage twixt my crown and me and then betwixt me and my married wife let me unkiss the oath betwixt thee and me. And yet not so, for with a kiss twas made, 
part us, Northumberland, I towards the north, where shivering cold and sickness pines the clime, my wife to France, from whence, set forth in pomp, she came adorned hither like sweet May, sent back like Hallowmas, or shortest of day. And must we be divided? Must we part? I, hand from hand, my love, and heart from heart. Banish us both, and send the king with me. That were some love, but little policy. Then whither he goes, thither let me go. So two, together weeping, make one woe. Weep thou for me in France, I for thee here, better far off than near, be near the near. Go, count thy way with sighs, I mine with groans. So long as we shall have the longest moans. Twice for one step I'll groan, the way being short, and piece the way out with a heavy heart. Come, come. In wooing sorrow let's be brief, since wedding it there is such length in grief. One kiss shall stop our mouths and dumbly part. Thus give I mine, and thus take I thy heart. They kiss. Give me mine own again. T'were no good part to take on me to keep and kill thy heart. They kiss again. So, now I have mine own again, be gone, that I may strive to kill it with a groan. We make woe wanton with this fond delay. Once more adieu, the rest let sorrow say. Exeunt. End of Act 5, Scene 1. Act Five, Scene Two, the same, a room in the Duke of York's palace. Enter York and his Duchess. My lord, you told me you would tell the rest when weeping made you break the story off of our two cousins coming into London. Where did I leave? At that sad stop, my lord, where rude, misgoverned hands from windows tops threw dust and rubbish on King Richard's head. Then, as I said, the great Duke Bolingbroke, mounted upon a hot and fiery steed which his aspiring riders seemed to know, with slow but stately pace kept on his course, while all tongues cried, God save thee, Bolingbroke. You would have thought the very windows spake, so many greedy looks of young and old through casements darted their desiring eyes upon his visage, and that all the walls with painted imagery had said at once, Jesu preserve thee, welcome, Bolingbroke, whilst he, from the one side to the other turning, bareheaded, lower than his proud steed's neck, bespake them thus, I thank you, countryman, and thus still doing, thus he passed along. Alack, poor Richard! Where rode he the whilst? As in a theatre the eyes of men, after a well-graced actor leaves the stage, are idly bent on him that enters next, thinking his prattle to be tedious, even so, or with much more contempt, men's eyes did scowl on gentle Richard. No man cried, God save him, no joyful tongue gave him his welcome home, but dust was thrown upon his sacred head, which with such gentle sorrow he shook off, his face still combating with tears and smiles the badges of his grief and patience. That had not God for some strong purpose steeled the hearts of men, they must perforce have melted and barbarism itself have pitied him. But heaven hath a hand in these events, to whose high will we bound our calm contents. To Bolingbroke we are sworn subjects now, whose state and honour eye for eye allow. Here comes my son Armorel. O Mel that was, but that is lost for being Richard's friend, and, madam, you must call him Rutland now. I am in Parliament pledge for his truth and lasting fealty to the new-made king. Enter O Merle. Welcome, my son. Who are the violets now that strew the green lap of the new-come spring? Madam, I know not, nor I greatly care not. God knows I had as lief be none as one. Well, bear you well in this new spring of time, lest you be cropped before you come to prime. What news from Oxford do these justs and triumphs hold? For aught I know, my lord, they do. You will be there, I know. If God prevent not, I... 
propose so. What seal is that that hangs without thy bosom? Yea, looks thou pale. Let me see the writing. My lord, tis nothing. No matter, then, who see it. I will be satisfied. Let me see the writing. I do beseech your grace to pardon me. It is a matter of small consequence, which for some reasons I would not have seen. Which for some reasons, sir, I mean to see. I fear, I fear. What should you fear? Tis nothing but some bond that he's entered into for gay apparel against the triumph day. Bound to himself, what doth he with a bond that he is bound to? Wife, thou art a fool. Boy, let me see the writing. I do beseech you, pardon me, I may not show it. I will be satisfied. Let me see it, I say. Snatches it and reads. Treason, foul treason, villain, traitor, slave. What is the matter, my lord? Ho, oh, who is within there? Enter a servant. Saddle my horse. God, for his mercy, what treachery is here? Why, what is it, my lord? Give me my boots, I say. Saddle my horse. Now, by mine honour, by my life, by my troth, I will impeach the villain. Exit servant. What is the matter? Peace, foolish woman. I will not peace. What is the matter, Amril? Good mother, be content. It is no more than my poor life must answer. Thy life answer? Bring me my boots, I will enter the king. Re-enter servant with boots. Strike him, Amrel. Poor boy, thou art amazed. To servant. Hence, villain, never more come in my sight. Exit servant. Give me my boots, I say. Why, York, what wilt thou do? Wilt thou not hide the trespass of thine own? Have we more sons, or are we like to have? Is not my teeming date drunk up with time? And wilt thou pluck my fair son from mine age and rob me of a happy mother's name? Is he not like thee? Is he not thine own? Thou fond mad woman, wilt thou conceal this dark conspiracy? A dozen of them here have ta'en the sacrament and interchangeably set down their hands to kill the king at Oxford. He shall be none. We'll keep him here. Then what is that to him? Away, fond woman, were he twenty times my son, I would appeach him. Had thou groaned for him as I have done, thou be more pitiful. But I now know thy mind. Thou dost suspect that I have been disloyal to thy bed, and that he is a bastard, not thy son. Sweet York, sweet husband, be not of that mind. He is as like thee as a man may be, not like to me or any of my kin, and yet I love him. Make way, unruly woman. Exit. After Amorel. Mount thee upon his horse, spur post, and get before him to the king, and beg thy pardon ere he do accuse thee. I'll not be long behind, though I be old, I doubt not but to ride as fast as York, and never will I rise up from the ground till Bolingbroke have pardoned thee. Away, be gone. Exeunt. End of Act 5, Scene 2. Act 5, Scene 3. Windsor, a room in the castle. Enter Bolingbroke as king, Henry Percy, and other lords. Can no man tell me of my unthrifty son? Tis full three months since I did see him last. If any plague hang over us, tis he. I would to God, my lords, he might be found. Inquire at London, amongst the taverns there, for there, they say, he daily doth frequent, with unrestrained loose companions, even such, they say, as stand in narrow lanes, and beat our watch and rob our passengers, which he, young, wanton, and effeminate boy, takes on the point of honour to support so dissolute a crew. My lord, some two days since I saw the prince, and told him of those triumphs held at Oxford. And what, said the gallant? His answer was, he would unto the stews, and from the commonest creature pluck a glove and wear it as a favour, and with that he would unhorse the lustiest challenger. As dissolute, as desperate, yet through both I see some sparks of better hope, which elder years may happily bring forth. But who comes here? Enter O'Merle. Where is the king? What means our cousin, that he stares? and looks so wildly 
God save your grace, I do beseech your majesty to have some conference with your grace alone. Withdraw yourselves, and leave us here alone. Exeunt Henry Percy and Lords What is the matter with our cousin now? For ever may my knees grow to the earth, my tongue cleave to my roof within my mouth, unless a pardon ere I rise or speak. Intended or committed was this fault, if on the first how heinous ere it be to win thy after love I pardon thee. Then give me leave that I may turn the key that no man enter till my tale be done. Have thy desire. O Merle locks the door. Within. My liege, beware. Look to thyself. Thou hast a traitor in thy presence here. Villain, I'll make thee safe. Drawing. Stay thy revengeful sword. Thou hast no cause to fear. Within. Open the door, secure, foolhardy king. Shall I for love speak treason to thy face? Open the door, or I will break it open. Bolingbroke unlocks the door and afterwards relocks it. Enter York. What is the matter, uncle? Speak. Recover breath. Tell us how near is danger, that we may arm us to encounter it. Peruse this writing here, and thou shalt know the treason that my haste forbids me show. Remember, as thou readst, thy promise passed. I do repent me, read not my name there. My heart is not confederate with my hand. It was, villain, ere thy hand did set it down. I tore it from the traitor's bosom, king. Fear and not love begets his penitence. Forget to pity him, lest thy pity prove a serpent that will sting thee to the heart. O oh, keenest, strong and bold conspiracy, O oh, loyal father of a treacherous son, Thou sheer immaculate and silver fountain, from whence this stream, through muddy passages, hath held his current and defiled himself. Thy overflow of good converts to bad, and thy abundant goodness shall excuse this deadly blot in thy digressing son. So shall my virtue be his vice's board, and he shall spend mine honour with his shame, as thriftless sons their scraping father's gold. Mine honour lives when his dishonour dies, or my shamed life in his dishonour lies. Thou killst me in this life, giving him breath. The traitor lives, the true man's put to death. Within. What ho, my liege, for God's sake, let me in. What shrill-voiced supplicant makes this eager cry? Within. A woman, and thine aunt, great king, tis I. Speak with me, pity me, open the door. A beggar begs that never begged before. Our scene is altered from a serious thing, and now changed to the beggar and the king. My dangerous cousin, let your mother in. I know she's come to pray for your foul sin. If thou do pardon whosoever pray, more sins for this forgiveness prosper may. This festered joint cut off, the rest rests sound. This let alone will all the rest confound. Enter Duchess. O King, believe not this hard-hearted man. Love, loving not itself, none other can. Thou frantic woman, what dost thou make here? Shall thy old dugs once more a traitor rear? Sweet York, be patient. Kneels. Hear me, gentle liege. Rise up, good aunt. Not yet. I thee beseech, for ever I will walk upon my knees, and never see day that the happy sees, till thou give joy, till thou bid me joy by pardoning Rutland, my transgressing boy. Unto my mother's prayers I bend my knee. Kneels. Against them both my true joints bended be. Kneels. Ill mayst thou thrive if thou grant any grace. Pleads he in earnest? Look upon his face. His eyes do drop no tears, his prayers are in jest. His words come from his mouth, ours from our breast. He prays but faintly and would be denied. We pray with heart and soul and all beside. His weary joints would gladly rise, I know. 
our knees still kneel till to the ground they grow. His prayers are full of false hypocrisy, ours of true zeal and deep integrity. Our prayers do outpray his. Then let them have that mercy which true prayer ought to have. Good aunt, stand up. Nay, do not say stand up. Say pardon first, and afterwards stand up. And if I were thy nurse, thy tongue to teach, pardon should be the first word of thy speech. I never longed to hear a word till now. Say pardon, king, let pity teach thee how. The word is short, but not so short as sweet. No word like pardon for king's mouth so meet. Speak it in French, king, say pardonne moi. Dost thou teach pardon, pardon to destroy, O oh, my sour husband, my hard-hearted lord, that settest the word itself against the word? Speak pardon as tis current in our land, the chopping French we do not understand. Thine eye begins to speak, set thy tongue there, or in thy piteous heart plant thou thine ear that, hearing how our plaints and prayers do pierce, pity may move thee pardon to rehearse. Good aunt, stand up. I do not sue to stand. Pardon is all the suit I have in hand. I pardon him, as God shall pardon me. O oh, happy vantage of a kneeling knee! Yet I am sick for fear. Speak it again. Twice saying pardon doth not pardon twain, but makes one pardon strong. With all my heart I pardon him. O oh, God on earth thou art! But for our trusty brother-in-law and the abbot, with all the rest of that consorted crew, destruction straight shall dog them at the heels. Good uncle, help to order several powers to Oxford, or wherever these traitors are. They shall not live within this world, I swear, but I will have them, if I once know where. Uncle, farewell, and cousin, adieu. Your mother well hath prayed and prove you true. Come, my old son, I pray God make thee new. Exeunt. End of Act 5, Scene 3 Act 5, Scene 4 Another room in the castle Enter Exton and a servant. Didst thou not mark the king, what words he spake? Have I no friend will rid me of this living fear? Was it not so? These were his very words. Have I no friend, quoth he? He spake it twice, and urged it twice together, did he not? He did. And speaking it, he wistly looked on me, as who should say, I would thou wert the man that would divorce this terror from my heart, meaning the king at Pomfrey. Come, let's go. I am the king's friend, and will rid his foe. Exeunt. End of Act 5, Scene 4 Act 5, Scene 5 Pomfret, The Dungeon of the Castle Enter King Richard I have been studying how I may compare this prison where I live unto the world, and for because the world is populous, and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it. Yet I'll hammer it out. My brain, I'll prove the female to my soul, my soul the father. And these two beget a generation of still-breeding thoughts, and these same thoughts people this little world, in humours like the people of this world, for no thought is contented. The better sort, as thoughts of things divine, are intermixed with scruples, and do set the word itself against the word, as thus, Come, little ones, and then again, It is as hard to come as for a camel to thread the postern of a needle's eye. Thoughts tending to ambition, they do plot unlikely wonders. How these vain weak nails may tear a passage through the flinty ribs of this hard world, my ragged prison walls. 
and for they cannot die in their own pride thoughts tending to content flatter themselves that they are not the first of fortune's slaves nor shall not be the last like silly beggars who sitting in the stocks refuge their shame that many have and others must sit there and in this thought they find a kind of ease bearing their own misfortune on the back of such as have before endured the like thus play i in one person many people and none contented sometimes am i king then treasons make me wish myself a beggar and so i am then crushing penury persuades me i was better when a king then am i kinged again and by and by think that i am unkinged by bolingbroke and straight am nothing but whate'er i be nor i nor any man that but man is with nothing shall be pleased till he be eased with being nothing music music do i hear <laughs> keep time how sour sweet music is when time is broke and no proportion kept so is it in the music of men's lives and here have i the daintiness of ear to check time broke in a disordered string but for the concord of my state and time had not an ear to hear my true time broke i wasted time and now doth time waste me for now hath time made me his numbering clock my thoughts are minutes and with sighs they jar their watches on unto mine eyes the outward watch whereto my finger like a dial's point is pointing still in cleansing them from tears now sir the sounds that tell what hour it is are clamorous groans which strike upon my heart which is the bell so sighs and tears and groans show minutes times and hours but my time runs posting on in bolingbroke's proud joy while i stand fooling here his jack of the clock this music mads me let it sound no more for though it have hope madmen to their wits in me it seems it will make wise men mad yet blessing on his heart that gives it me for tis a sign of love and love to richard is a strange brooch in this all-hating world enter a groom of the stable hail royal prince thanks noble peer the cheapest of us is ten groats too dear what art thou and how comest thou hither man where no man never comes but that sad dog that brings me food to make misfortune live i was a poor groom of thy stable king when thou wert king who travelling towards york with much ado at length have gotten leave to look upon my sometimes royal master's face oh how it yearned my heart when i beheld in london streets that coronation day when boiling broke rode on roan barbary that horse that thou so often hast best rid that horse that i so carefully have dressed rode he on barbary tell me gentle friend how went he under him so proudly as if he disdained the ground so proud that bolingbroke was on his back that jade hath et bread from my royal hand this hand hath made him proud with clapping him would he not stumble would he not fall down since pride must have a fall and break the neck of that proud man that did usurp his back forgiveness horse why do i rail on thee since thou created to be awed by man wast born to bear i was not made a horse and yet i bear a burden like an ass spur galled and tired by jauncing bolingbroke 
Enter Keeper with a dish. Keeper to the groom. Fellow, give place. Here is no longer stay. If thou love me, tis time thou wert away. My tongue dares not that my heart shall say. Exit. My lord, wilt please you to fall to? Taste of it first, as thou art wont to do. My lord, I dare not. Sir Pierce of Exton, who lately came from the king, commands the contrary. The devil take Henry of Lancaster and thee. Patience is stale, and I am weary of it. Strikes the keeper. Help! 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 Enter Exton and servants, armed. How now? What means death in this rude assault? Villain, thy own hand yields thy death's instrument. Snatching a weapon and killing one. Go thou and fill another room in hell. He kills another. Then Exton strikes him down. That hand shall burn in never-quenching fire That staggers thus my person. Exton, thy fierce hand hath with the king's blood Stained the king's own land. Mount, mount, my soul, thy seat is up on high, Whilst my gross flesh sinks downward here to die. Dies. As full of valour as of royal blood, both have I spilt. Oh, would the deed were good! For now the devil that told me I did well says that this deed is chronicled in hell. This dead king to the living king I'll bear. Take hence the rest, and give them burial here. Exeunt. End of Act 5, Scene 5 Act 5, Scene 6 Windsor, an apartment in the castle Flourish. Enter Bolingbroke and York with lords and attendants. Kind Uncle York, the latest news we hear is that the rebels have consumed with fire our town of Sicester in Gloucestershire. But whether they be ta'en or slain, we hear not. Enter Northumberland. Welcome, my lord. What is the news? First to thy sacred state wish I all happiness. The next news is, I have to London sent the heads of Salisbury, Spencer, Blunt and Kent. The manner of their taking may appear at large discoursed in this paper here. We thank thee, gentle Percy, for thy pains, and to thy worth will add right worthy gains. Enter Fitzwater. My lord, I have from Oxford sent to London the heads of Brockus and Sir Bennet Seely two of the dangerous consorted traitors that sought at Oxford thy dire overthrow. Thy pains, Fitzwater, shall not be forgot. Right noble is thy merit, will I wot. Enter Henry Percy with the Bishop of Carlisle. The Grand Conspirator, Abbot of Westminster, with clog of conscience and sour melancholy, hath yielded up his body to the grave. But here is Carlyle living, to abide thy kingly doom and sentence of his bride. Carlyle, this is your doom. Choose out some secret place, some reverent room. More than thou hast, and with it joy thy life. So as thou livest in peace, die free from strife. For though mine enemy thou hast ever been, high sparks of honour in thee have I seen. Enter Exton with attendants, bearing a coffin. Great King, 
Within this coffin I present thy buried fear. Herein, all breathless, lies the mightiest of thy greatest enemies, Richard of Bordeaux, by me hither brought. Exton, I thank thee not, for thou hast wrought a deed of slander with thy fatal hand upon my head and all this famous land. From your own mouth, my lord, did I this deed. They love not poison that do poison need. Nor do I thee, though I did wish him dead. I hate the murderer, love her murdered. The guilt of conscience take thou for thy labor. But neither my good word nor princely favor with Cain go wander through shade of night, and never show thy head by day nor light. Lords, I protest my soul is full of woe, that blood should sprinkle me to make me grow. Come, mourn with me for what I do lament, and put on sullen black incontinent. I'll make a voyage to the Holy Land, to wash this blood off my guilty hand. Much sadly after, grace my mornings here, in weeping after this untimely beer. Exeunt. End of Act 5, Scene 6. And End of Act 5. End of the Tragedy of King Richard II by William Shakespeare.